I guess if this is just like an ordinary panel, I think maybe I should ask people to uh, tell everybody who they are, even though I'm sure the audience knows, but uh, if you just sort of talk about, uh, you know, who you are and uh, what your current uh, uh, achievements are and your current uh, brags are. And uh, I guess maybe go, let's see, should we go counterclockwise and go with Stephen first? I think that might work. I don't know whether it's going to, are you, the way I'm, the way my screen reads it, like I'm in the upper right hand corner, and underneath is Stephen, and then Jeffrey, and then Wynn. Is that what's with you? It's different for all of us. Everybody, different. Okay. Okay. Oh. Why would it be? Why would it be simple? Okay, but I'm going okay, to. Um, I'm I'm Stephen Silver. Uh, I've been publishing short fiction for about tw actually not about twelve years. My first short story appeared twelve years ago yesterday. Um, and earlier this year, I published my first novel after Hastings, which is an alternate history and has absolutely nothing to do with the topic of this panel. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I run conventions and I work for CIFWA and uh, I'm here to talk about a, a sustainable future. Cool. Cool. So when? Um, I am Wen Spencer. Uh, I've got books out. This is my most recent, which is a um, reissue of the Tinker book because I have a two book follow up coming on it. Um, it was supposed to be one book called Harbinger, but after I hit 120,000 words, it was only like a quarter of the way through the storyline. I was like, uh, it's going to be two. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Fabulous. When Spencer, cool. Jeffrey? And I'm Jeffrey Landis. Uh, actually, a long time ago, when I first began my career, I used to be a solar cell scientist, so I know a little bit about uh, solar cells, if nothing else. Now I work at NASA and uh, work on various missions. In my copious spare time, uh, I sometimes write science fiction, and I don't have a recent novel out, but I just noticed, oh, let's see, I guess I have to turn off if I'm going to show something that isn't me, I have to turn off my virtual background, don't I? So I this one just arrived in the mail uh, the other day. So I have a story uh, in this collection, the 2020 look at Mars fiction book. Okay. I'm going to hold up my title just because okay. everybody else is doing it. That's what people do. <laughs> nice. Nice. But hold it up again, Stephen, so we can see the cover. Yeah, I'll back a little bit so we can see it. Yeah. Well, the problem is if I get it back too far, nice you're going to get cover. some uh, Very intriguing. I like it. So. I like it. So cool. Okay, I'm Mary Trezol. I guess you probably know that, but uh, so let's see what my, uh, okay, I can't show you my, I can't show you my latest because I don't have it up. Never mind. So stop share, stop share, what stop share? No. Mm. Or stop share. No, no you're, you're good. You're not sharing, Mary. Oh, well, then that's why there's no share. Okay, very good. It probably, I'm probably not allowed to share. No, I don't see. Nope, don't see it. Okay, so. You're allowed. If you yeah. take your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. I know. I said share, but the thing is that I don't have the picture up. It's not on my, I can't share my, my desktop because I, I, I destroyed it when I did the last one, so I can't do it. So, okay, so share screen, share nothing. All right, so stop share. There we go. Sorry. No, I, I had uh, my, I, well, I suppose I could actually show you the novel if I've got it here. <laughs> Never mind. This is so embarrassing. I was, oh, I had, no, there it is. This is the, this is the latest book. Okay. Uh, Mars Girls. Uh, it's by Apex. And, um, it's uh, basically, I think it might be YA. I didn't mean it to be, but I think it did turn out to be YA because it's got a YA protagonist. 
and uh, I've got a couple of stories in, in analog recently, and, uh, and that's me. So let's talk about uh, the whole idea of sustainability. Um, what is sustainability? You know, when I was looking at this, the first thing I thought of is, well, sustainability on Earth means, well, environmentally friendly. Is there a difference between being sustainable and environmental friendliness? And let's see, Stephen, what do you think? Oh, I didn't want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, well no, I, I mean, you know, the two concepts are definitely linked. Um, you know, uh, if we want to be sustainable, part of that is going to be fr being friendly to the environment. But I think sustainability also has a lot to do with developing technologies that, um, you know, allow us to get more out of what we have, uh, more efficient uh, ways of pr producing energy uh, that at the same time, of course, are less pollutant. So for instance, the step towards uh, electric cars is helpful, you know, because we're putting less pollutants in the air, you know, we're not having to drill the oil out and everything. And of course, as the cars, whether traditional hybrid or electric become more efficient, they become, you know, that helps with the sustainability uh, aspect. So what I uh, have been, been have to add to this. Pardon? Uh, I was going to jump in and say I've been um, watching a lot of videos where people are doing homesteading and um, it's basically a back to nature kind of thing where you go off the grid and I find it very interesting because it kind of speaks to sustainability but I think it has a hidden danger that um, it then is uh, isolated so that we can't have the massive projects that help you move t technology towards something greater. Um, if everybody goes off and does their own things, um, we don't have the collective push that you kind of need to change the world. Okay, so what about pairing that up with the idea of uh, eating locally, you know, arranging to eat foods that are grown locally rather than having to move them from place to place? which gets you some of the benefits of, you know, going off the grid and creating your own food, but also gives you the chance to form the community that can put their brains together and come up with better ways of doing things. Well, I'm on Hawaii, uh, the big island. So we really get this kind of drummed into us. What is sustainable and what is things like lo eat locally? Um, one of the weird things is we have, lots and lots and lots of cows, but processing the cows is hard and it requires refrigeration. And because we're an island, our electric costs are so through the roof, we can't age the meat to the point that tourists will buy it as high quality. So all the big restaurants here, even though there's a cow outside the restaurant, serves Denver beef. Um, it's, it's one of those things where, yes, it's great idea. Yes, it, it's good. It works. But it's also, you can only grow certain things in certain areas. Yeah, um, it's not at all clear that the idea of eating locally is necessarily the idea of being sustainable. Uh, that's, I think, a uh, a misthinking. If you are living, say, in Cleveland, and eating locally means we have to make heated greenhouses in order to force things that just grow almost wild, if we were, say, 300 miles further south, uh, it's not necessarily a, a good bargain. The idea that the transportation cost is the major cost of, of food is uh, you know, sort of uh, not necessarily true. Uh, there can be other costs of food other than just the, uh, the transportation cost. Well, I don't know that it's necessarily the transportation cost. It's the... I think is great about science fiction is that science fiction really makes you think in the long view. Uh, we do think about 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, a million years from now. 
And uh, when you start thinking that way, you start thinking, well, okay, we can pump oil out of the ground, but oil doesn't last forever. Uh, a thousand years from now, are we still going to be pumping oil out? A million years from now? So science fiction, I think, is almost crucial, learning to think like a science fiction writer. Uh, if we want to be sustainable, you have to have that view. What yeah. will the world be like a thousand years from now? What will it be like a million years from now? And, and I think that's why I'm going back to the whole off-the-grid homesteading. Uh -oh. yes. Is it reasonable? When if you're talking, I can't hear. Did my volume go down? Um, I, I can hear Gwen. Or when. Sorry, a cat, a cat just... I think the, the cat stepped cat on your keyboard. Turned off the computer. <laughs> Uh, what I was saying is that the homesteading is all, I'm going to cut down a tree and burn it, or I'm going to have, you know, solar, but often, again and again, it's, it's wood burning, it's wood burning, it's wood burning. And it's like, well, that's nice when you have two, three acres of woods and you're growing scrub trees as fast as you can, but that's not an ideal for the world. And when you're talking about Hawaii, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a lot of controversy about geothermal energy, which might make some sense in Hawaii, but doesn't make sense religiously. Is, or is that still an issue? Um, that's the same flat earth people. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know. People are saying that the geothermal plant triggered the volcanic eruption that we had a year or two ago. And the problem is, is that the plant is where it is because there was a volcanic vent there. And in 1950, before they even started talking about yes. uh, geothermal energy, there was an eruption right in the same exact point. Um, to say that the geothermal causes the eruption is like, you're ignoring the entire plate tectonics <laughs> of the planet. Um, the volcanoes are there for a reason. <laughs> They're going to erupt. Um, and the locals have no problem with the geothermals. We have a lot of people shipped in from California and such who are all out there. <laughs> Um, and that's where the problem comes in. You know, they have anti-vaccine kind of ideas, homotherapy, um, pathy beliefs. They, they cling to the anti-science, it seems like. I had also heard that there was some discussion of uh, native religion being, believing that it was uh, sacrilege to drill down and uh, try to harvest uh, energy geothermally. Well, that's not one I've heard, but that was a while that's ago. Because I don't know. There's other issues huge in the area. Uh, we have um, 14 observatories on top of the mountain, yes. and that is a huge issue. And they're trying to put the TMT in, uh, the 30 meter telescope, and um, that's gotten involved with a lot of politics who have pulled in people who believe that um, it's sacrilege. And it's a messy issue because some of the people who are fighting it are lying a lot about the fact that the TMT people is a nonprofit agency that's already doing wonders for the local school districts. Um, and they consulted for 10 years with all the local shaman and religious heads and carefully picked out a site that everybody was happy with. And then money became an issue. And that's when everything started blowing up, when money got passed out and the money didn't go into certain hands. and then it got big and messy and complicated because there's a lot of truth and there's lots of lies and um, it's full of crazy. 
So there may be a lot of political, political issues in any drive toward, toward uh, sustainability. Oh yeah, um, it, it, the young me would have said no, but the old me is discovering that things like flat earthers and anti-vaxxers and people that ignore science are huge and will lie and give death threats and do all sorts of crazies um, to fight science. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's a big part of the problem. It's it's not just about um, uh, the political aspect, but it's also the anti-science attitude that seems to be growing uh, in our country in a big way. Uh, you know. Jeffrey was talking about coming up with the ideas as, as thinking like science fiction authors. But if you have people who have a vested interest, either uh, emotionally or financially in the old way of doing things, drilling the oil out of the ground, ripping the coal out of the ground, instead of looking for more sustainable ways of generating power, hydroelectric, solar, geothermal, it becomes very difficult to switch over our entire infrastructure to these new ways of doing things. So is this an issue that we're going to have to think about fairly soon if we're going to talk about space, space colonization? Yeah. We need more billionaires like Elon Musk who doesn't turn their control of their company over to board of directors who then kowtow to shareholders who are only looking at profit. Uh, you need somebody who says, I have this big vision and I'm not going to let anybody get in my way of my big vision. That's what government used to do. They used to say, we're going to the moon. We're not going to let anything get in our way. We're on the moon. Um, now we need billionaires with a vision who keep control of their companies. Well, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about Mars. Uh, that seems like a possible uh, source for colonization, and we need sustainability there. I read a recent science fiction novel, uh, so, sorry, short story about water wars on Mars, where there, because there is uh, a limited amount of water on Mars, but it's uh, it, there's competition for it. But how could how could um, how could sustainable colonies exist on Mars in terms of protection from uh, Cosmic rays, uh, water conservation. Uh, what would what would happen there? If there's uh, different different plans, what what do you think might happen? What would be appropriate and, and desirable? Well, that was kind of what the whole biodome experiment, uh, what the '90s was Bio about. Yeah. Pardon? Biosphere. Yeah. Biosphere. You know, creating a closed <laughs> environment where you could recycle everything. Uh, as a stepping stone towards colonizing a place like Mars, where every little bit is needed to be recycled. Um, you know, and it wasn't entirely successful here. Um, and the thing is, when if you build something like that on Mars, you are going to have leakage at the, in the very best scenario. So you have to figure out a way to um, be able to replenish what you lose. Yeah, that certainly is something that's very true, is that learning how to live in space, learning how to make self-contained ecosystems, uh, is going to tell us a lot about our own ecosystem, about what it is that it takes to be sustainable on Earth. Back in the, oh, I don't know, 70s and 80s, a lot of the space settlement community was talking a lot about, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to move all of the manufacturing to space. And our factories are going to be in space, so they won't pollute the earth. But they're almost thinking about it backwards. Because all of the stuff that we call pollution on the earth, if it was in space, we would call it valuable resources. We're not going to be burning coal in space in order to produce power because coal is far more valuable in space than, than anywhere else. So really, space is teaching us the technologies 
to make a biosphere run, to make a biosystem work, to make everything recyclable. And space is teaching us the technologies to make factories that don't pollute uh, because we don't have the stuff that we can just throw away uh, in space flight. Uh, we have to reuse everything. Yeah, um, a book just came out, I think it came out in September. I read it a couple months ago uh, by Terry Virts, who's a, an ISS astronaut. It's called How to Astronaut. And it is a wonderful book. The chapters are like four pages each, and it tells you everything you want, not want to know about going into space. As I was reading it, I was thinking every science fiction author should have this book on their shelf. But one of the things he talks about in the book is talking about how they recycle everything um, you know, on the International Space Station uh, to get the most use out of it, which is kind of graphic at times, but it, it, it's useful information to have. Yes. You know, they recycle almost everything. Yes. And we're going to have to do that in Earth, ultimately. If we're going to be around for a million years, we can't keep digging stuff out of the Earth and, uh, and burning it or smelting it. We're going to have to reuse the stuff that we have. So, um, One of the things that I find living here in Hawaii is the distance involved changes a lot of what we take as granted. Uh, we have trouble with the fact that recycling requires us to find a buyer and then ship it to them. And it, it's much more difficult for us than uh, we're going to truck it down the street uh, we have to, Hilo in the Big Island um, really doesn't have a major port. We have minor ports and we get our goods brought in on a barge. And it's quite remarkable to see come into harbor because it's this little tow truck and tow boat. And then like a mile and a half behind it is the barge. I, I really don't understand how this works. It's kind of mind bending that they're so far apart, but that's everything that comes in and everything that goes out has to be on the barge. And uh, the sh we're having horrible troubles recycling plastic because we can't get rid of it. What's it the solution to that? Off. There has to be a solution because recently we switched um, uh, trash systems, garbage systems, and um, the new system won't let us recycle almost anything. We can recycle cans wow. and bottles if they're plastic, if they're plastic but have screw tops and glass bottles. And that's it. And before you know, you could throw in yogurt containers. And my husband, uh, Jeff, did a little investigation and discovered that in fact, they hadn't actually been recycling all that stuff. They had just been throwing it away because it's more expensive to recycle it than just throw it away. So, yeah, um, maybe this has to start upstream. Maybe what we need to do is insist that, I don't know, uh, what would be the solution? Maybe have, have uh, edible cartons. You know, when you buy, uh, when you uh, get a quart of milk, it's, uh, you know, you can then melt it down and have it for dinner. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know about edible, but biodegradable, certainly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, you know, although when, you, you're, when well, you're dealing with liquids, you have to do weird things to it to make sure that they don't leak. Otherwise, they're not good for very long. Yes. Well, so, biodegradable is one solution, but recyclable is another. Yeah. If you can take the plastic and just reuse it, that would also work. Yeah. We've gotten, it's more expensive to recycle that. it than it is to just throw it away. Yeah. Well, of course. We've gotten rid of all plastic shopping bags. And yes. we gotten rid of all styrofoam food containers, oh, which yes. actually all the small businesses were against because to them that was how they did things. They, they packaged everything in styrofoam and sold it. And mm -hmm. to go to a biodegradable container was more expensive for them because, you know, they don't sell as well on the mainland. So, you know, it, it costs money, more money, and 
it was a lot of pushback against the switch, but it was better for the environment long run to go to biodegradable. So it's one of those where the government has to kind of push it through the society because the society pushes back. Mm -hmm. Well, I think consumers want things to be recyclable. I mean, I loved it when most of the stuff that left our house was recyclable, but it doesn't I mean, get more. Fans are in a minority. Oh, maybe. Um, unfortunately, we believe science is right. We believe science will save us. And um, it seems as if there, that's a minority. Yeah, Mary, it's interesting because my mother-in-law lives just a bit south of, of the two of you. And uh, she has the same kind of recycling issues that you have, where what she's allowed to recycle is negligible. Mm -hmm. And about a month before COVID lockdown struck, um, Elaine and I were down there helping her clean up because she's planning on selling her house and moving up here uh, to the Chicago area to be closer to us. And, you know, we did a bunch of recycling runs and it was essentially paper that was not glossy, you know, wasn't bound, you know, all these stipulations. And we looked at her and said, you know, we have a van. We're just going to take everything that you can't recycle. We're going to toss it in the van and we'll recycle it when we get home. And so we schlepped all this stuff up back up to Chicago with us and tossed it into our recycling where we're allowed to recycle a lot more than she is. But I will say my daughter, who's very socially conscious, um, recycling is one of the things that I just cannot get her to do. You know, every week when I go to empty the garbage in her room, you know, I look in the garbage and there's paper in there, there's cans in there and there's garbage in there. And it's like, it's really not that difficult to, separate it out, uh, you know, as you throw it away. If you need a second garbage can, one for recycling, one for garbage, we can do that. Um, and it's just, for some reason, that's one of the socially conscious things that is not important to her at all. That's one of the things that you, you, if you learn a lot about the Japanese, that kind of, it's all mindset, it's all culture, is from very early on, you know, like the 1980s on, Everywhere you go, there is a bin for plastic, a bin for paper, a bin for, and the society has strict social rules and people don't break them because they don't want to be shamed because people will shame them and they will feel the shame. And it's this overall cultural oneness, which is working for them. It works well mm -hmm. for them. Um, but they also have like the day that you're supposed to take the plastics out. If you get caught by your neighbor taking paper out instead of plastic, your neighbor will shame you and you will feel bad. Um, and we don't have that. Unfortunately, what we do have is we have a culture where everything is disposable. I mean, you know, even as recently as when I was a kid, if something broke, you took it to the repair shop to get it fixed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, a few Whoa. years ago, I had a turntable. Yes, I'm that old. I had a turntable that stopped working. And I couldn't get it. You know, I, when I took it in to get it fixed, the guy looked at it and said, well, I can fix it. But frankly, it's, it would cost you a lot less to buy a new one. Well, you sure. get a better product. It would cost you less. There's no reason to fix it. And it's that way with just about everything when you take it in oh, to get it repaired. Uh, let, yeah. let me tell you something worse than that. Okay, we had a microwave oven that I loved. It was red, which for some reason or other I liked particularly. And uh, it stopped working. So um, I thought maybe there was a fuse, one thing. But I have a very good appliance repair guy. Well, over the telephone, he, he uh, diagnosed it. And he said, there is no way to fix it. There is apparently one tiny part that is missing and... There is just no way to fix it. So this enormous, uh, well, I don't know, it's as big as a microwave oven, just has to be tossed. It's insane. I have bought two, I probably shouldn't rave, but I have bought, I had a, a thing called a bullet, a Nutribullet, and I love the Nutribullet. It lasted about, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. So it died, and I felt, feel bad about throwing it out, so I went and bought, it and bought another one. We brought it home, and it didn't work. I called up the company. They said, well, you have to brush the, the dresses for 10 minutes. And it will work. So it worked once after that, and then it stopped working. So I took it back and bought another one, and then the other one has the same problem with it. 
I mean, this is criminal. I mean, why do they make things that don't work? I mean, it's one thing to say only it works for two years, but when it only works like not at all, and then it has to be tossed, it's insane. We do, have a, we, we do have a question from Diane asking, uh, what do we see sustainability practices going in 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? And she's asking us to speculate wildly. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not getting past 2020. I mean, uh, <laughs> I see us in mud huts uh, if this continues much longer. Well, I, I think the 50-year answer, quite honestly, is minor incremental in, you know, increases in sustainability, you know, little things. Um, because there's a lot of social inertia against it. There's a lot of money against it. Yeah, we have somehow have to change society's mental state. There's and so I've many different ways. Too. There's so many different ways that the culture could go, that the technology could go, that it is a wonderful thing to speculate on as a science fiction writer. Yeah. But it's hard to sort of say, oh, this is the way it will happen. Well, I think the problem is less the speculation on the, on the technological ways and more how you're going to sell those technologies to the society as a whole. Yeah. Can I give you a utopia, a utopian solution? Sure. I think that uh, my friend Neela, who is in the audience, right, I believe, uh, has a uh, uh, desktop uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. unit. I have not seen it. I've seen them in action and I, they're very interesting, but you know, it seems like it ought to be possible. Okay, so you can make this a gear for something that is missing a gear, you know, you get you download the software and makes it, but why couldn't you then, if the machine is broken, why couldn't you break it up in little pieces, put it in a funnel and have it be feedstock, reduced to feedstock to make another machine. Well, all that takes energy. So energy is probably the key. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is the feedstock? Well, it would have to be different stuff because some of it would be metal, some of it would be plastic, different types of plastic, different kinds of metal, I suppose. Right. But, but um, 3D printing is, is really amazing what they're able to do with it. And I know, I know that they do 3D printing on the, the space station so that they don't have to ship everything they need up. They just have to ship up the, the, um, the filament mm -hmm. and they can make certain pieces to do repairs up there. Um, honestly, several years ago, I was at the, uh, America Books, the American Booksellers Association convention and it may still have been called the ABA back then. And I was walking along the floor with Cory Doctorow and we came across a guy who was demonstrating a very early model 3D printer and he, listening to Corey talk to the guy was just amazing because mm -hmm. Corey knew more about the 3D printer than the guy who was demoing it. I believe that. So, you know, but they've come a long way in the last 20 years uh, with what you can do and, and everything. And they're not just toys anymore. Yeah, well, what you would think about is the question, what goes into it? What is the stuff that they're printing? So what you're thinking well, about 3D okay. printing is I that have. it means that we can make our own stuff locally rather than have to ship it in from long distances. I, ha I have a solution for that too. The, we'd have to standardize what things are made out of. Probably it means that we would no longer make things out of metal because metal is harder to work than other things, but there'd be certain kinds of plastic and these would have to be developed. Mm -hmm. And maybe there'd be I don't know, three or four different types of feedstock, but things would have to be manufactured mm -hmm. in such a way that they could use only these three or four types of things. Mm -hmm. And then when the thing breaks down, well, you chop it up in little pieces, which is a lot of fun, actually. You know, take a hammer and bake break the thing up, stick it in the thing, and then, you know, you've got more feedstock. Yeah, you'd probably want to make some sort of biofeedstock. And that's not out of the question. Uh, there's sort of two approaches to the biofeedstock. One is sort of the old fashioned technology where you basically use just good old uh, industrial chemistry and convert plant material into whichever plastics you choose. But the glitzy way to do it would be to have plants that actually make the material you want. So bioengineered plants. Genetic engineering, you should be able to make a plant that produces uh, plastic feedstock. Mm -hmm. It comes right out of the field. 
So that's so, a possibility. I, I kind of think, though, we're kind of going at the Model T level of things, where we're imagining society as if we were trying to deal with, you know, how are we going to deal with these Model Ts? I think technology is going to advance to the point where, you know, the whole bits and pieces are going to be put together in such a way we can't even imagine at the moment. Well, you're a I science fiction artist. Your job in, to imagine it. <laughs> yeah, I have great faith in science. And I think that, you know, if society doesn't fall apart in the next six months. Uh, well, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, that uh, it, the whole thing's like the broken microwave is going to be child's play. It will be, uh, hmm. you know, run by bits and pieces that we, we don't have right now, so. Well, let's, let me, I want to tur turn to another topic. So when I first read this topic, one of the things that occurred to me is, okay, so there's a couple of ideas here. One of them is the plastic bag thing. Because plastic bags were a great thing. We were going to get rid of them, right? Remember, we were going to get rid of them six months ago. And all of a sudden now, you can't bring a reusable bag into the grocery store near me because, oh, it's covered with COVID virus. And maybe it is, too. I don't know, but it's dangerous to do it. So all, all of a sudden, plastic bags are back in business. The other side of this is... Well, we stayed with paper bags. Uh, paper bags are still, you know, yeah. and they're also heavier, which means that they, they takes more. But here's the other side of that. Okay, so a long time ago, there were books, and there's, it, this is absolutely true, that it is more environmentally sustainable for people to live close together so that they don't have to travel to care to get um to get um 10 minutes okay we got 10 minutes to get uh you know to go to a restaurant to uh ship groceries from here to there or whatever so that everything is close together uh you know tall towers that people live in and now we discover that the place that has the tallest towers in the world where people are living very close together was the place that covid virus started decimating people so it's almost like Nature is playing ha-ha with us. Okay, well, Mary, this actually gets back to something that Leslie, uh, Leslie asked us in the Q&A way back at the beginning of the, the panel about half an hour ago, yeah. which is no one wants to speak about population control anymore. You know, yeah. and, you know, we've developed ways to deal with the fact that we have an exploding population. Yeah. Uh, but we're also piling people on top of people on top of people in the major cities. Uh, as opposed to spreading them out over all the available land evenly. Um, so is population control something that we are going to have to refocus on? Uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine er uh, earlier this year, after COVID struck, said he was reading uh, John Runner's Stand on Zanzibar, mm -hmm. and it was feeling amazingly prophetic to him. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. is that going to be, you know, some, an area that we have to turn our attention to again in a much more urgent manner. Well, I don't think, I don't think population control is an issue in New York's in Manhattan. I mean, I don't think that's why Manhattan is, is, you know, was a, a COVID hotspot and why people are living very close together. That's not because I, I would be willing to bet that uh, the population growth of, of New York City, as far as new births is concerned, is probably about zero. I bet the average couple produces two children, maybe. Negative more likely one, more likely zero. Historically, cities never reproduce themselves. Cities have negative growth. Yeah, you, but, have, uh, you know, the social experiment of China that shows that <laughs> happen yeah. when you try to do population control. You have children that are hidden and no, can't be part of the society because they don't have birth records. Uh, you have children abandoned along the riverside because we already have our one and it's a boy. Um, you know, it, it's one of those where um, well, we have figured out a way to do it right. You have well, a we have we have figured out a way to do it right. The industrialized world has less than 
R equals one growth rate. The industrialized world has negative population growth. What we learned is that the way that China did it, coercive population control is the wrong way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but we still have New York cities. We still have big cities. And, and we still have religious yeah. groups in America that yeah. quiver full, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. have as many kids as the woman can spit out. Uh, but even nevertheless, when one was birth can damage and, and the mother had problems, we're going to go for baby number 20. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, the intrinsic population growth of America is negative. We are getting population growth from imports. We are importing people. But then you have the Japan problem that all the people are in the cities and nobody wants to be in the agriculture and the small towns are dying and mm -hmm. the elderly um, are not are outnumbering the young. So That's because Japan has negative population growth. Yes. So and you can't win. You're saying, oh, if population growth is bad and declining population is bad. Yes, okay. it, it's a complicated issue, uh, which should be its own panel on itself. <laughs> that would be a good panel. And certainly not one that we have real time to discuss in the last five minutes that we have here. No. It's we just that the pandemic just destroyed all the sustainability that we had. The only thing, the only thing that I've seen out of the pandemic is I believe, I'm not sure of this, I, it, maybe it's just through my own experiences, that people are uh, going to um, farm markets more, which means that they're buying local food. Well, the other thing is that people aren't taking massive trips. Yeah. We're not burning billions of Driving their cars of around. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, it's interesting because when this all started, I was thinking, how is society going to wind up changing once we're allowed to go out again? once we're allowed to mingle, once we're allowed to travel again. Mm -hmm. And I, if, you had, when you, if you had asked me that back in April, I would have assumed that there were going to be massive changes. And if you ask me that now, as I see people who are champing at the bit to get their lives back to normal, whatever the consequences, I don't think that we're gonna see huge changes. I, th I think that once COVID is under control with the vaccine, people are just going to go back to the way they were living their life before it struck. We're having horrible problems here because like 85% of our uh, economy is tourism, but we only have one hospital on the island and it was quickly at max, you know, one month in. So we wow. can't allow people in, but our economy is geared to have people in. So we've got a lot of people up in arms to open because, you know, we're losing businesses right and left. Wow. But at the same time, we can't reasonably open up. Well, I'm getting a message from our um, artificial intelligence overlords saying that we should wrap up. Uh, I believe there's a way to con continue the discussion in Discord. Yes. Um, but uh, let's everybody... Uh, just uh, what are your thoughts about sustainability for the future? Does it have to do with space travel? Is space travel going to help us? Just a few words, um, starting with when. Um, I think we need to have some kind of radical culture change uh, for us to pull out of what we have, um, get people to recycle, to get people to support going to Mars again um, is to see the value with space travel even. Um, I find the mindset of a vast number of our population quite depressing. And uh, I think we really need to change it somehow, but I don't know how. I think that early potential colonies, whether a colony is industrial or an actual colony on the moon or Mars, will have to be sustainable. Uh, they're going to have to find ways to have almost 100% recyclability, sustainability. I'm not sure that that's going to last beyond the first generation. Um, you know, the natives are going to have a very different outlook. Now, it's possible that if it's handled well, 
uh, that it will be a societal and a cultural thing. Um, you know, as Wen was talking, saying with the, the Japanese and, and recycling, that it, by the time that next generation comes along, it will be ingrained in the culture to be sustainable and recyclable. However, I don't have that optimistic and rosy view of human nature. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey? And I guess my summary would be mostly what I already said. I think we have to learn to start thinking about a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. And uh, of course, science fiction is the tool that we use to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and for spaceflight, one thing spaceflight gives us is the ability to see our planet from a distance. We can see that it's a thin shell of atmosphere above a blue planet. We can compare it to other planets. So not merely that we learn technologies from spaceflight, uh, but we also just learn what our world is like and how it's different from the other worlds. Uh, so spaceflight gives us that long view. So spaceflight and science fiction, that's what we need to save the world. Well, if you're, uh, if you're in the audience, I believe you can get a Discord link so that this, uh, the panelists and attendees can continue this discussion. Uh, I could read it to you, but. Uh, we, we've posted it in the chat. Good, good, okay. Well, uh, I've been very fascinated by this. I've gotten a lot of new ideas, uh, a lot of new viewpoints, and uh, uh, I'm not as I'm not as cynical about human nature. I think the young people maybe understand that they are going to be living in this world longer than we are, and maybe they got to fix it. But I could be wrong, unfortunately. I hope I, I hope am. so. I hope uh, I hope I'm not wrong. Anyway, thank you so much. I've just been really blown away by some of your ideas and stuff like that. I'm just going to stay here in orbit around Jupiter until you guys get the COVID thing all cleared up. <laughs> so if you guys could send me a pulse when that happens, I'll, I'll come back. I understand there's a very high radiation rate there. Radiation, you know. I, I have good shielding. Oh, good, good. Yeah. There's a lot of water surrounding me. <laughs> okay. Thank you to the audience for coming and listening to us. And oh, oh, no, no, no. Thank you to the rest of the panelists. Oh.